For Jesus in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though being a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all of those who obey him, being called by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. As I told you already, the high priest office was instituted under Moses. Aaron was its first. But before Aaron, back in the book of Genesis, uh, back in the days of Abraham, Abraham had just come back from the slaughter of the five kings. And he meets a man named Melchizedek. And Abraham gives him a tenth of everything he had. And then the priest there does an offering uh, to the Lord for um, Abraham. And in that process, we meet him. And his name is Melchizedek. We're not told about his earthly parents. And he just sort of comes on the scene and then he's gone. He has no beginning. He has no past. He only had a very short present uh, with uh, Abraham. And so that high priesthood is the one that is likened to Christ, who has no beginning and no end. And so he said, I made you a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But I want, here's what we're going to center in on in this part. Go ahead and hit me the next one. All right. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. You're saying to yourself, wait, he's God. How can he learn anything? We're going to take a look at that. Through what he suffered. Now, this is important for you and for me that we should learn this. Because sometimes we feel like maybe we're experiencing something that nobody's ever experienced. You know, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. You know, the old song would go. Sometimes we feel like nobody would understand. Nobody does, nobody feels what I'm feeling. Nobody gets hurt the way I get hurt. Yeah, there is somebody who knows. And we want to take a look at that. Jesus could say that. Nobody knows, because it would be true of him. But he doesn't. So let's take a look at this. Though he was a son, yet learned obedience through what he suffered. So let me get the first one here. Sonship does not exempt him from suffering. Jesus was the Son of God. Absolutely no difference in that. He is emphatically the Son of God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He existed with God before the world began. Jesus Christ is declared throughout Scripture to be the Son of God. He is the Word of God. God and the word was made flesh telling us that he existed beforehand before the worlds were formed before anything else Jesus Christ the Father the Son the Holy Spirit these three ordained what would occur in this life so Jesus Christ is and it needs to be understood very much so the Son of God if you have a father there must be a son I was always, I was born a male child, I became a man, but I became a father when I had a son. The father is called the eternal father, therefore the son must be eternal as well. If he is the eternal father, the everlasting father, then he must have an everlasting son. So Jesus Christ is the son of God. He told us that who he was, that no one has seen the Father except the Son. He told us over and over again that he was the Son of God, what the Father, what I have seen the Father do, that's what I'm doing. Why are you surprised at the miracles I perform? My Father could do it, he's given for me to do the same thing. And so Christ, not only is he God, but he was the well-beloved. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well-pleased. We have to understand that because Jesus is going to suffer. And yet we have to understand who he was. He was the Son of God. 
He is the well-pleasing one. I have always done what my father has asked me. The father would say, this is my beloved son, hear him. And so over and over again, we come across these things. Christ was a son whom God intended to honor above all else. To which of the angels has he said at any time, sit here at my right hand until I've made all your enemies your footstool. Although he has been made a little lower than the angels for suffering, yet it was the father's intent that the son should reign at his right hand for ever the son of God will stand before the throne all power has been given unto me Jesus would say in heaven and on earth all power the right to judge was given to the son the son has been given all authority the angels themselves worship him the whole world is to bow before what is it that the father wants the world to know who Jesus is and what does the father want of the world but to worship his son Jesus Christ that's the end of man to worship the son and so I say this if the son of God wasn't exempted from suffering then what makes us think that we should be we think it's strange and what does the writer James say to us think it not strange when you come into temptation don't think it's something out of the ordinary when you find yourself in a trial when you find yourself being tested why should that be strange to you if God's own son was tested if he was tried so there's no exemption for you and for me are we not the children of God yes have I not been adopted yes but if God's own begotten son is tested then why shouldn't I expect to be tested second one so then we said that suffering does not mar his sonship his poverty because he was born poor, because he was born in a manger, does that make him not the Son of God? No. Although it was said of him, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, does that remove his sonship? No. His temptation. Because he was tempted, does that affect the fact that he was the Son of God? For 40 days and 40 nights he was taken into the wilderness and there he was allowed to be tempted by the devil. Does that say because he was tempted he's not the son of God? Because he was tested? No. He was tested to prove who he was. Christ endured slander. Does that jeopardize his sonship? They said of him, you are demon possessed. You are a Samaritan and have a demon. Because they said those things of him, does that mean that he's not the son of God? when they abuse and maybe perhaps might say things uh, of a nasty nature toward you and me does that somehow sever the bond that we have with Jesus Christ no not at all no slander ever jeopardized his sonship they in fact slandered him because he was the son of God it was because of the miracles that he performed it was after the feeding of the 5,000 it was after his journey through Samaria where the city of the Samaritans came to accept him as Savior that they would make such accusations against him because he was deserted by his friends does that not make him the son of God because Peter would deny him because John and the rest would desert him because Judas would betray him did that somehow not make him the son of God no even the felon felonious death that he suffered he suffered the worst of death the crucifixion that Christ the Bible says cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree the Romans reserved this crucifixion for the worst of the worst you had to be a notorious criminal in order to be hung and yet there is Jesus Christ hanging the worst the most shameful the most disgraceful listen if you had a son who was crucified you denied him because it meant that he was that kind of a person he deserved that kind of a death and so does his crucifixion mean that he is not the son of God no the opposite for you and for me because he was the son of God 
he went to the cross for you and for me. Next. So we say this much then. Obedience is a thing which was to be learned even by sons. Because obedience has to be learned experientially. Now, could not the angels have taught Jesus how to be obedient? Did he really need any instruction on how to obey? Weren't we told that when he was 12 years old that he went home and was obedient to his parents and to God? Jesus, we would see, wasn't a troubled child. He didn't do anything wrong, so why would we say he had to learn? But obedience is not something we can be taught. It's something we have to do. Someone could tell me about doing right and wrong, but watch my life and see if I do the right and the wrong. Because obedience has to be learned experimentally. You have to do it. You can't just talk. The angels couldn't draw pictures for him and say, this is what obedience looks like. He had to have it done. Look at the obedience he was required. He was obedient unto death. And then there's the clause that they add in. Even the death of the cross. To say to someone you have to die. I often say I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want it to hurt when I go. There is no more painful, slow, agonizing death than crucifixion. It takes hours to die on that tree. In fact, remember, it was so slow that they crucified the thieves about 9 o'clock in the morning. When the sun went down, they still hadn't died yet. And so, remember, they broke their legs so that they wouldn't be able to rise up anymore and get any more breath. They snapped their legs so that they broke. They couldn't pull themselves up to gather any more air, and they suffocated there. On It took all day long for them to bleed out. That's why they were surprised when they found Jesus and he was already dead. Hey, we put him up last. And he's already dead. The sun hasn't even gone down. And he's already dead. They were surprised at it. See, obedience is something that has to be learned experimentally. You and I have to learn by oh, our obedience, by our suffering. To find that we are obedient to God only happens in the troubles that we're in. It's easy for us to want to throw up our hands and to say, I'm going to walk away from God because this is hard or this is tough. Think of the martyrs. How they had suffered for Jesus Christ. They learned true obedience in what they had suffered. See, there is no way to obtain true happiness except through obedience. And how can we learn to obey unless it is hard? It's easy to do that. You know, most of us want to be Christians when there's nothing to be Christian about. When Christianity doesn't cost us anything, it's easy to say, I'm a Christian. But if you ask people to give something up, then all of a sudden Christianity becomes too much and they don't want it anymore. There's no way to obtain happiness except by obedience. And obedience, unfortunately, we only learn it through suffering, through trial, through testing. Next. So we come to this. The obedience that we have been speaking about is not to be learned except by suffering. And if that is true of Jesus Christ, then it must be true of you and me. Because suffering touches a man's own self. You see, when I have to obey, that's me. Suffering is something that I can feel. Suffering sometimes hurts so bad you can't tell people how you feel. It touches us, and it touches us in a way that may not touch somebody else. I don't know sometimes what you feel, because I have never gone through what you have gone through. When I watched my sister lose her 10-year-old boy, 
There was absolutely nothing I could say. I couldn't begin to imagine that pain and that hurt. I could pray for her, but I, it, I, I felt so useless. Because what could I say? What could, how do I know how she's feeling? I have suffered hurt, but I have never lost my 10-year-old son. I've never had to watch the cancer eat up at his brain. I've never had to go through that. You see, suffering touches a man at the very self, at who and whatever we are. That's where it hurts. And we find out who we really are and what we are really made of under that suffering. When we could look at God and still claim him as our savior when he looks like he's the enemy. That's why we learn through suffering. She learned that her Christianity was real because it didn't shift. She didn't abandon it. Jesus Christ was still her Lord and Savior even though he was in the process of taking her son. Secondly, our graces are put into the fire and tested. Our Christianity, that which we say we hold dear to, it's easy for us. See, here's the testing is Jesus says not everybody who says Lord, Lord is saved. It's so easy to say I believe in Jesus. The world we offer to them what we call easy believism. Just say Jesus and you'll be saved. And that's not true. Her testimony given by a young man once and he's at this drunken party. And he jumps up on the table and he says to everybody, say Jesus. And pretty soon everybody's chanting Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hundreds of drunken teenagers are all hollering Jesus. And he says, see, now you're all saved. <laughs> and yet Jesus says, whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, yes, shall be saved. But not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, there has to be a change. There has to be a difference in us. Obedience makes the change. Jesus Christ was different from any other man that ever lived because Jesus Christ followed the Father closer than any other man. Jesus Christ and Christ alone was the sinless one and he was sinless in obedience to his Father. You and I, although we try to obey, we're not sinless because we're not really all that good at following the Father. But we at least are making the attempt. We look at our lives and we say, I want to be more like Jesus. And he says, are you sure? I say, oh yeah, Lord, I want to be like you. And then the next thing you know, I find myself in some testing and some trial. He said, hey, I am full of grace. You want to be like me? You have to be a little kinder. You want to be like me? You have to be a little more patient. You want to be like me, you have to be a little more compassionate. All of these are things that aren't me by nature. So he had to work on each and every one of those things that I might become that. The last moment, and I want you to hear this, the last moment before our death will teach us something concerning obedience which we have not learned the rest of our lives. As we begin that passage into the valley of the shadow of death, we're going to find out the reality of our own Christianity. And it will seem scary going through that valley if you are not sure, if you have not learned yet obedience, that might be a scary place. If you haven't learned yet to trust Jesus Christ on this fair and glorious day, how are you going to feel trusting him on the day when you feel your breath leaving your body? And suddenly you can't clutch back on, you can't pull back to this whole earth. You've got, you are sinking and sinking and you will see this life fading away and you will see this light growing dimmer and dimmer. What do you grab onto then? 
See, in those moments of death, when there's nothing to hold on to, because life itself is leaving the body, and there's no more strength or energy, we are going to find out what we learned in life. And if all you have experienced and all that you have learned is this life, then your education ceases. If you have learned Jesus Christ, and if you have learned that he loves you, and if you have learned the Father's love, if you have learned that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, then as this world begins to fade to us, the new world begins to come into focus. And we exchange this dim light for the bright and glorious light of everlasting life. Jesus' human life was not a script that he passively followed. It was a life that he freely chose. In John chapter 10 verse 17 we read these words, Therefore my Father loves me because I laid down my life so that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down from myself. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. I have received this commandment from my Father. What commandment? The commandment to lay down my life. If the father had the right to ask his son to go to the tree, then what rights does the father have over our life? What right does he have to ask and what is he allowed to ask of us? Everything and anything. Not my will, but yours be done. That's what Jesus said. Our life is to be learned through the difficulty that we pass through to learn to say to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. You have given me this life that I might lay it down. Now granted, I can't take it up again, but I know who can. And Jesus promised that if I have placed my faith in him, that even though I should die, yet I will live. That's why I death is not a scary place for me. You see, the life of Jesus was a continual process of making the will of the Father his own. Our life should have been, at, last, at least for me, the last 63, I'm 63, so I got saved roughly when I was just a kid. So let's, okay, 43, we'll go at 43. Now it's more than that. 45, 47, something like that, years, I've been a Christian. And the hope is that in those 40 some odd years that I have been trying to become what the Father wants me to be. Did not the Father lay out a plan for my life and did he not lay out a plan for yours? Is it not my responsibility to find my plan for my life? Was not it the responsibility of Jesus to find out what the Father wanted him to do? And wasn't the Father willing to tell Jesus what it was? This is the Father's will that I should lay down my life. If the Father told the Son his will, hasn't he laid it in our hearts as well what we're supposed to do? Then aren't we supposed to be about my Father's business? As Jesus would say. Jesus chose to obey. Even though obedience led him to the death of the cross, he chose to obey. And that's the thing. You and I have a choice that we make every day. I get up in the morning, I could choose to obey the Father, or I could choose to obey myself. Because Jesus obeyed perfectly, even under the greatest of trials, he can help you and me to obey. No matter how difficult obedience may seem to be, we can still do it. I can obey. You can obey. We could choose to bring honor and glory to the Father. We can choose to glorify His Son. Or we could choose to use this life any way we want and pay the ultimate price for it. Yes, there may be pain in our growth process, 
But in the pain, there is great glory. Maybe not for us, but there is glory for the Father. We all glorify the Father through Jesus Christ. Those are our songs that we sing. And we glorify the Father through the Son because of the suffering He went through. Christianity is based on how we suffer. If the Son suffered, then maybe I have to ask myself, listen, if I haven't suffered in this life, maybe am I really a son? If He called His Son to suffer, why am I not suffering? Am I not a son too? So don't be surprised, as James says, when we find trials and trials in this life. Think it not strange. The son didn't. And if we are his sons and daughters, we shouldn't either.